And thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that after hearing a few talks that I'm in the right place. Um, and also that since I, you know, 50% of the time I'm not doing water, I'm actually even more motivated to do more about water now. The you know, more I hear about the problems that we are going to be facing or already facing. Um, given that I have 10 minutes before lunch, I will try to go really fast, or I could follow the US president's model and tell you that this talk is going to be so good, you would forget lunch. <laughs> OK, let's start. Um, so I, I think you already heard that while we predict all kinds of scenarios, often people forget that we have huge uncertainty in them. I mean, uh, it's not Im you know, impossible to imagine that anything we predict beyond a certain number of years is not going to be uh, you know, that clear that it's, it's coming uh, without any uncertainty. Right? So uncertainty is something we can't get rid of. It doesn't matter which kind of thing we're trying, what best models we do. Uh, the farther you go, obviously the uncertainty grows. Okay, that's, that's how it is. On the other hand, do we just give up? Well, I mean, we can't give up because we still have to build something today for something that has to last the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So the best thing to do then is, well, take that into consideration, the uncertainty into consideration. Okay? So this is my major uh, you know, impetus here. And my work that I do in the university and teach other people is all about this, how do we uh, take uncertainty into consideration. I mean, most of us depend on, say, eventually some kind of investments that we do, whether it's a pension fund or your own RRSPs and so on. I mean, how uncertain are your earnings? Actually, it's quite a lot, but we manage it very well most of the time, not always. I mean, there are people who sometimes had a lot of money and then they have nothing because they are the ones who actually took a huge risk with their money, right? Um, the ones who were a bit more conservative, uh, you know, or too conservative, they didn't grow their income much. But the ones who are somewhere in between are doing not bad. Okay, so given that kind of idea, we're you know able to use that for whether it's infrastructure design or any other project. So that's that's the thing. So I do have like three or four slides at the very kind of end with mathematics, but I can always skip that because we might be too hungry by the time. Um, <laughs> Also, I was just hearing from somebody here that we should have really fancy pictures and, or things to scare you. So I said, well, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Toronto in, well, 240 million years ago. Okay? Um, and if you think I'm making it up, you can see this one. Uh, it's all science-based, not fake news. Um, <laughs> Toronto is right in, almost in the middle of the equator. Okay? Um, so we were a tropical country. Okay, I mean, obviously we didn't exist at that time. But um, it's affecting us in different ways, meaning that our geology is affected, our ecology is affected, but with all the climate change that we're predicting, well, it will somehow help us or not help us. We'll see how it goes. So this is the time when dinosaurs started moving around. And that's the time when they died uh, 70 million years ago. So we are kind of gone north now, right? You can see the Great Lakes systems quite north. And India was still an island. It's an amazing thing to even think of that. Um, of course, we like predicting things. And <coughs> thanks to David's uh, slides, I think he had this there. And I'm assuming that um, someone did great models to do it, because it's not that easy to predict these things. Um, but what you don't see, of course, is they don't say how uncertain about these numbers they are. Okay, I think uh, it's a Dave Milner who complained about that today, this morning. So I'm going to keep complaining about it. But um, I also stole one slide from Dave Milner, so I'll show you later. Um, so the idea is, of course, we need all these numbers, but they are all without whether you think or not is coming with uncertainties. Okay, um, because there is no way we can be sure about all these numbers. Well. If those numbers are true and getting worse, in some sense, that's Toronto High Park about 100 years from now. Okay? Maybe the children would love it. And this is another uh, interesting uh, thing to know, that Earth temperature 
was probably only about, in the last 500 million, never more than about 22 degrees on an average. Okay? We are about 12 to 13 degrees now, somewhere here at the bottom here, um, and going fast like that. Okay? And the worst thing is, every time it hit like somewhere around 20 degrees, there was huge extinction. Okay? Um, so part could be outside influence, part could be inside influence. So everywhere we hit over 20 some degrees, like there are about four or five peaks there, we had huge extinction, meaning about 60 to 90 percent of the species just vanished. Okay? So, I mean, why should we care? Well, the thing is, we are not only be living because we have all these nice concrete structures and stormwater drainage. We need plants, we need food, all that stuff, right? So we can't just ignore those things. And of course, they're all affected by, um, you know, the predicted climate change. Okay, uh, let's come back to more like engineering kind of thing. Uh, why do we need to consider uncertainty? Well, we like money. Um, so let's start with the money. Most of the time what we do is, when we have that numbers like you know, 166 millimeter rainfall or something like that, we try to do some kind of structure, right? But often, uh, even today, people end up with some one value for the design because that's the one you have to set it up. There's nothing you can do about it, right? Um, so when you do that, they, suppose you build some structure, but you're going to look what, how it does for the next 100 years. Uh, it's, you know, it's going to have some costs and benefits, okay? So um, the way that we do look at it, that suppose you design something without considering uncertainty, right, in an explicit way. So I'll tell you later what explicit way means. Um, you may get some cost uh, from that, okay? That's EEV. On the other hand, I'm going to sell you this, you know, uh, method called the uh, method using risk and other uncertainties in your design. Then this is going to give you a cost like that. Okay, we can show this mathematically this true, uh, you know, so you, we can show that. So you have what is called value stochastic solution, right? So if this now difference between conventional method and using this method that is using all kind of uncertainty and some other things I will talk to you later, uh, it gives you certain value for the next 100 years. Um, and if the difference is obviously not much, who cares, right? But if the difference is very large, that is difference between these two methods give you a very large number, then it may be worth investing, studying this RP, right? How does this method work so that I can save all this money? Um, another way people look at the same thing is also called uh, expected value of perfect information. So in the first case, the value of stochastic solution. In this case, this is expected value of perfect information. Remember, we all like to be very uh, sure about our things. That means you need perfect information, meaning no uncertainties. Suppose we had that. Okay, for this problem, whatever you are, you're designing a stormwater drainage system for some either subdivision or a large division. And you come up with this idea that if I use this method that uses uncertainty and the costs are, say, RP, but on the other hand, if I had perfect information, exactly I know the next 100-year future, what will be my design and what's the cost of it? That's WSS. Okay? So if you see the difference, if the EVPI is very small, then you might as well use RP. Who cares about perfect information? I mean, we know that's not hard. It's not easy to get, right? Um, so on the other hand, if EVPA is very large, it might be worth thinking about, should I spend some money on these guys who do modeling? And they can do a little better prediction of this data. Okay? And the prediction here includes not only prediction of single value, but how uncertain that value is. Okay? Um, so it's worth spending money if EVPA is very large. Okay? So it's a very good, quick way of thinking about even worth doing this or not. Right? So this is, the first, uh, this is why I, I use this as the first few slides. Um, I don't know. Every project will have different ESS and EVPI. And you can use both these values. And so far, I haven't really explicitly shown where risk comes in. So I'll show that later. Okay? Um, so we're almost uh, there in terms of uh, important information. Uh, one thing, of course, I want to say is what is risk uh, in terms of my definition. So I just want to make sure... Everybody gets the idea that, you know, sometimes risk is defined differently and so on. So I want to define it as, uh, for example, um, 
uh, risk may be defined equal to the probability of an event times the cost of that event. Okay? So it's eventually a dollar, right? On the other hand, um, you know, rare events have extremely high costs, but usually they have extremely low probability, so it was fine, right? But now we are seeing that with climate change, those rare events are not so rare anymore. Okay, so you can obviously see the risk is getting bigger, right? Uh, in dollar value, and of course, dollar value is affected by the probability of that event. So uncertainty is there, right? Um, so this is how I'm looking at risk because I have seen people uh, defining risk without any probability, right? But in my case, uh, it's done. Okay. So obviously, we want to do climate smart planning. Right, that's what we're trying to do in all this work. Um, often you've seen people saying that we have silo kind of approach, but I, I do you know, come from system design engineering, which looks at all kinds of systems, and I will not reject any one of them, whether it's social, ecological, environmental, so on. And, and of course, we're not going to remove economic realities because we have to eventually build them, right? And then, of course, uh, being in the, in the area of uncertainty, I also want to make sure that we don't ignore any uncertainties. For example, um, sometimes like you build a system for a certain, uh, uh, say, certain ability to withstand, say, floods, but then over time the system gets, you know, deteriorated to a level that um, it's not withstanding. So that's kind of. Uh, think might come from what we call aleatoric uncertainty. Like, you know, it's inherently changing because the pipes get rusted and uh, corroded or sometimes more calcified and so on. So the, the original quantity is not being passed anymore, right? So we can't do uh, without it. On the other hand, epistemic is simply things that we don't fully understand. There's always some variability, like typ typical ones would be like groundwater uh, parameters like perme permeability and so on, which we may not ever get it exactly right, but to some extent we can reduce the uncertainty by doing uh, drilling and doing testing and so on. Okay, so we have to understand that we may have both uncertainties. Okay, and of course what are we trying to do? Well, if it's storm water management, you want to build a big drainage system uh, today that will take care of the next 50, 100 years, right? So obviously the big cost is today, and hopefully the savings are over the next 50 years. Right? Uh, but the question is, we can be sure about what those savings are. Right? So somehow we have to use this information when we design uh, the system, because you don't want to design a system that is so huge, uh, assuming there's going to be a big problem coming, but that's not being met. Right? Uh, or it could be a water supply system. It doesn't matter which kind of system we are doing. For example, the next is a real example. I'm not just making this up. I live in Waterloo, uh, where supposedly not too many dumb people live. They're all smart, intelligent communities called. Um, but I've been there 30 years. I've been to one of the few people, I think, I've been one of the few professors who went to this you know, council meetings where they explain about all these projects, water projects and so on. I, I love going there because you know, I also want to know how these things work because I'm just a professor sitting there. I don't know how really these things work. And, it was amazing. When I was there, in, I went there in 1988. Around that time, they, they were talking about building a pipeline either from Lake Erie or Lake uh, uh, Huron to Waterloo to supply water because their demand projection was such that we couldn't supply from our water. That was coming mostly from groundwater. Okay. That was 88, and their projection was like in about 20 years, we needed the pipeline. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, I, being uh, all this skeptical about these numbers, I said, well, how can we get this number right? No, no, we have all these models and so on. It's clear this is what we need, right? Um, but what happened is, even after a few years, either because they didn't have money, of course, Lake Huron is out because it's out of the catchment, so you have to get it from Lake Erie, and so on. Uh, their original projection of 2008 was gone to, I don't know, 2035, okay, that when we needed water pipes. Okay. Now, they're saying, just uh, not even now, it's like four years ago, they say, well, we don't need it until 2051. And imagine that, if I had built my pipeline in, I don't know, 2000, assuming I'll be happy for the next 50, 100 years, it's a total waste of money, right? We didn't need that, because we couldn't predict all these 
conservation measures, what their impacts would be. Okay? So I'm not talking something completely from the textbook. It's, com you know, it's coming from real world. We are always going to have this problem. Like, we are never going to have this, somebody was saying about the best crystal ball, right? That will say everything exactly right. So nothing we can do. Well, again, just this morning, uh, Glenn said that many things were done, but they didn't talk about much of their uncertainty projection. And one of the next slides, he showed you a huge difference in the idea of values between, I don't know, 30 to 100 millimeters. I mean, imagine that. It's not that because they're so bad it is there, but it's because we have no way of predicting them any better. Okay? I mean, nobody wants to be doing some huge uncertain value. They want to do it right there, but it's not that easy. Okay? So given all that, how did they do it? I'm not going to say this very uh, detailed because we don't have much time. So you have all these uncertain scenarios, and they use the, usually the CO2 models that you can see. Um, as you go farther, they're very highly varying. Okay, we don't know which one is right. I mean, everyone has some reason for choosing one or the other. So it's never going to go away, right? So I'm not going to talk too much about it. You can see in my slides. So you can predict rainfalls from these tools, right? Um, so you can get some idea of various scenarios. And you can try to build, uh, I think a few people were saying about what are the infrastructure designs that could be helpful. I mean, one of the things that uh, you know, impacted me most is this uh, one from Rotterdam about how they could use uh, some kind of a parking garage but underground as a, a stormwater pond kind of thing, right? So uh, that may be one of the few things that I can think of for the city that I lived in India because it's a flat city going into this, you know, without any gradient and a huge city. And I found out today that it was a fourth, it is a fourth metropolis area in the world, fourth in terms of size. Okay, so there's a huge, people, a huge number of people there. So it's not easy to design things that would work easy, you know, that well. And the climate change or not impacted the rainfall into this idea that uh, compared to the current decade, uh, the previous decade was 50% less. So the current decade is 50% more than the previous decade in terms of the annual rainfall. So that's a huge amount of changes, right? But the next question is, is this the same going to be there in the past, in the future? Nobody knows. We have for Ontario, we have many things like this, so I'm just going to skip all this. One of the interesting things is, like, you know, um, I was thinking about uh, this climate analog. So, for example, um, you know, if suppose, say, Toronto is going to be tropical, right? <laughs> what should we do, you know, we do so that it's better? Okay, like, of course, some of the things you were talking about is making sure our power is on and so on and so on. But uh, there's another way to look at it. They usually have something like climate analog. They look more at the ecological sense. Uh, so if you say, I want climate analogy of this place in 50 years, that today I can go see, right? So it says in 50 years here, it will look like these areas today. Okay? So that gives us some idea of what solutions that other people are using today that might be useful for Toronto, for example. Okay, so that's a way that you can create uh, new infrastructure designs that might work. Okay, because we, we just really don't have too many choices there. Because we want something that actually is working. Right, so we have all this thing done. We got uncertainties. Everything is available. How do we actually use this? It's really simple, mathematically. Um, I'm going to just use one, one slide. Uh, and I'm going to really explain this, and you'll see it's not that hard. Okay? So think of it this way. There are only two stages in our life, today and future. Okay? We don't exactly define how many months today, today is, how many months future is, but let's not worry about that. I can show you more detail if you want later. But the idea is today and future. Right? So if something like infrastructure design, what you design and build today is supposed to last, I don't know, like some number of years, future. So that's it, there are only two stages. But when you build today, say that's x variable, you know, you have to know, you know, you have to engineer put this 25 inches pipe and that's it, right? You can't change that, okay? You tell him, you, he's not, you're not going to tell him uncertain values. Well. They are, oh, maybe between 15 and 25. No, you can't tell him. You tell him 25 inches pipe, lay it down today, right? So that's this variable. It's totally deterministic. You don't have to change anything. But you can't just do that without thinking the future, because future is uncertain, right? 
mean, there's no point in just saying everyone, oh, go do 20 paitas, but what if it's too little or too big? Well, that's what we have to consider. Consider the uncertainty, and if your 20 paitas pipe is not enough, what else you would do in the future? It could be a very quick thing you have to do, or you simply go and pay insurance money. Doesn't matter. Okay? That is, you know, is considered on this future area. So it's called recourse. Recourse costs. Okay? <coughs> so the one you design either is too much or too little, you're going to have some future costs. Okay? So now we're going to minimize both the current cost and the expected future cost, because remember, future costs are not clear. Why? You come with a probability, somebody is doing great moral, hopefully, and telling you, well, there's a 10% chance you'll be this, 25% of that, you know, 50 this, and so on. You can use that to get the expected cost for the future and current cost for now, and then minimize the total cost together. Okay. So this is a very basic model, but if you see here, I'm doing expected cost, so it's not explicitly taking risk into it. Okay. So that's the only other slide I want to show. Is it okay? It's not too hard. We just have to minimize not just today's cost, but today's cost plus expected future costs. This slide also explains the same model as we saw in slide 26, but in a slightly different notation. Uh, this is just because the next slide I use this kind of notation. Um, it's still the same thing. The x variables are corresponding to the current deterministic design variable, like you know how big a pipe should I lay this year, and how much it will save us in the future is given by the y variable and the res uh, and the uh, res uh, respective costs like q. Um, so in some cases it could be uh, cost saved, so it'll be benefits. In, in some cases it'll be costs. So if twenty five inches pipe uh, saved you a lot of flooding, so it's benefits, but it's not enough, then you're going to have costs. So now we'll have uh, a problem where we design today, but including expected future costs. This slide 28 uh, simply expands the same uh, two-stage problem to a multi-stage problem, but you can see in some detail, but it's very similar to what we've seen before, uh, except now, of course, you have multi-stages, so I have to uh, have a, a bit more uh, expansion of these variables here. Um, we'll see this in a, with a sim simple example next and that actually is going to make it easier. So in um, this slide, the uh, slide where we use just uh, five scenarios, and in this case I'm using, um, so current time period is zero. Uh, if the future, the first future period has two possible scenarios, uh, so we're going to note one or four, and then from the next period from there, uh, we have three scenarios in the case if you go to four, uh, two scenarios if you go to one. So in total, from today to the two periods from now, we have five scenarios. And now I have expanded the previous slide uh, in this manner. So you can uh, see first the constraint set. Uh, so for example, uh, you, you have to relate both current and future. So in the very first two equations, you see the current pe period uh, constraints is given by a naught x naught. Then the uh, next period is connected to current period through a1 x naught plus b1 x1 and so on. Um, the interesting thing here is a naught, a1, b1, all these are seven different possibilities. Um, so in, here we are assuming that's all possible. Um, but of course, obviously, the more possible scenarios we have, the bigger this problem is. Um, that's the one the only difficulty with this kind of method where the problem can be very large, although it's not too hard these days to solve these. In terms of the objective function, uh, you can see now I have not only the minimize the total expected cost, but I'm also going to minimize some weight of the variance from those costs. Um, this is where we bring in the idea of risk, and in this case, we are uh, using variance as a pseudo-variable um, instead of risk itself. You know? So this is going to be our way of expressing the uncertainty in the future. Okay. So I'll show this uh, with some results, how uh, uh, something like this equation, the objective function, can be used to generate trade-offs between 
uh, expected costs and the risk from those uh, expected costs or risk from taking decisions that gave the same expected cost but with a different risk. So that's in the next slide. Okay, again, I'm, I don't want to scare you more there. <laughs> so you could do multi-stages, it's not a big deal, but of course a big deal in terms of numbers and so on, but it's not a big deal for a you know, reasonable engineer. But what's interesting is um, <laughs> this kind of is where this is the final curve you need to see. So you can see here, this is expected value, this is risk, right? You as the decision maker, I mean you means it could be your council, it could be your people, your country, whatever, have a choice to decide how much risk you're willing to take. Just like when you go to invest, the broker is going to ask you, is this money you need tomorrow, or you need 20 years from now, or 50 years from now? So the longer you are, you're willing to take a little bit more risk because of so much uncertainty. But shorter it is, if you're retiring and you're putting your, you know, pulling your money, you don't want to put in any risky account, you just put in some kind of GIC thing, right? It'll always grow in some small amount, but it will be there. So it's risk-free. So here is the idea. So obviously, the, this is risk. So if you want to reduce risk, expected cost goes up. Okay? So I mean, if you want risk of zero, you, you have infinite cost. I mean, it's obvious, right? So you can get, of course, have infinite cost. So you are willing to reduce it to get some risk. Okay? So obviously, you're reducing risk. And once you're here, it's, it's clear that you cannot reduce risk much, but you know, I mean, sorry, you cannot reduce the cost much, but the risk simply increases, okay, because there's no more possibility there, okay? So there are no more structures to build, nothing to build, but the risk simply increases. So it's not po no point going too far down either. But anyway, it's up to you. You make the choice. Uh, you mean the people in the country, city, whatever, make the choice how much risk they're willing to take. So this is what called risk, included minimization or, prop, uh, or optimization. It includes current and future, because we know future is uncertain, there's no choice, um, and how do we do it? So that's basically the idea of uh, uh, you know, my talk, is that we cannot ignore uncertainty, but we have to include it. Many of you are great engineers, you know when different scenarios are given, what kind of infrastructure will work, and each infrastructure will have different costs and benefits, so we use them all, and essentially come up with a solution that, of course, we all have to vote on, which allows us to take a certain amount of risk, and also that means we are willing to pay that much money to build it today, right? So that's the general idea of this. Anyway, I, I have uh, the slide trades there, including the one Glenn Miller said, and I just want to thank my daughter, Kamari, because she told me to think about far more than I was doing, so I'm happy to be doing this kind of work. Um, and any questions, I can probably talk to you during lunch. Thank you. Thank you.